We're on the home stretch. So if you look at the program, my task was a, a discussion and setting priorities um, based on the last um, section. And I really, because we've had some very good discussion, I was brave enough to attempt some prioritization. And so I, in bold, so what I've done is basically made a list of criteria and it really follows very nicely uh, from Pat's sort of last maybe four slides. And what I've done is list some criteria for sample selection or cohort selection. But in addition, I have set some priorities and I've put two of them in bold. It seems like two things that we've heard over and over and over again is sample size and broad phenotyping. And from the sample size point, I don't think that there is a single cohort or beautiful cake, a single cake that will satisfy all of our needs. So we're gonna to have to have some kind of an amalgamation of data from multiple cohort studies. And I agree with the comments of the last couple hours that there are some challenges of harmonizing data both from the sequencing point of view and the phenotyping point of view, but there, there are challenges that are not insurmountable. There, there are challenges that we need to know up front. We have quite a bit of experience and we need to carry that forward. One editorial, by the way, one thing I keep hearing, we've, we, as many people at this table, have spent a lot of time harmonizing phenotypes. Make sure we save those data and, <laughs> and build off of them. Um, so, because we can continue to do that, okay? The other is uh, the, the idea of the phenotyping themselves. I, and I sense a little bit of disagreement among the group about the importance of I'm, I selected the word exquisite phenotyping here. There's no doubt we need quality phenotyping. I, I think it was, I forgot who it was actually, about, you know, don't let, maybe it was Maynard, I think, let's not have perfect be the enemy of the good, that we have some very good phenotyping, and probably what we have is actually better than good enough, and we don't have to set the bar so high that we don't include certain cohorts. So we, just to repeat, we have an importance of sample size, we can bring together then multiple existing cohorts that are, that are with, has high quality phenotyping. Then the second is this idea of very broad phenotyping. At least for the initial discovery, we, we can benefit and learn from the GWAS experience that we can do a lot of harmonization. So having broad phenotyping would be very beneficial across the institutes and probably we can pick, you know, Eric Lander likes to talk about the 100 most important diseases. And my guess is we can make a lot of headway by identifying a set of core phenotypes of great public health um, importance where there is not good um, treatment and we can make a lot of progress. So the, I put those two in bold, by the way, and you can argue with me, but I said I thought those were the most important or highest priority. Number three, um, we, have a, we seem to be satisfied, and, and in fact we're embracing really as a mixture of direct measurements, and that means you're actually taking a person and putting a tape measure around their belly or, or putting a needle in their arm or having them spit in a tube um, right in front of you. Um, we're leveraging with follow-up questionnaires and also then linking this data with electronic um, health records of various kinds. It does not always have to be an EMR. There's a lot of other health information out there, um, both in this country and in Europe, and I, I would guess elsewhere, particularly since many of us are looking at, at phenotypes of in, in older individuals. There's, there's uh, Medicare, Medicaid, and, and national death indices that we can leverage. And I don't know that much about the VA, but we probably should consider linkages with the VA, I don't know. Not, okay. <laughs> She's gonna tell VA stories. <laughs> um, the next is, we seem to benefit a lot from two things. They're not really related, but I have them on the same line because it's really time, is ongoing contact. And, and that ongoing contact allows us for continuously measuring and updating information. And then it also allows us later when we want to find them and bring them back. 
So really, if you're a cohort person in the room and we need to get this message out, is keeping ongoing contact it seems to be very important for allowing cohorts to, to remain active and hopefully enter into uh, this program. Unlike a lot of meetings, and I think that it shows growing comfort within the field, I have number five. Obviously, there needs to be appropriate informed consent, but I am impressed that, that my opinion is w the field has matured for in, in many different ways, and we, we probably have reasonable informed consent in most of these cohorts right now. We've tried to update it. We've learned a lot. It may not be perfect, but my guess is it's reasonable. But extremely important, I put in, I, I sort of highlight is, is that ability to recontact. So, so it's it's important both we have ongoing contact and that ability to recontact, because we're not only satisfied with broad phenotyping, but we on, on specific individuals we may not want more in-depth phenotyping, and recontact is key. It can be in-depth phenotyping via questionnaire or using my example of bringing that homozygous individual in for a loss of function variant, putting them into a CTSA-like setting, I think there's a lot of advantages. I also think it's important that we consider diversity across the board, not just um, ethnic diversity and ethnic history. This, this country has a lot of other kinds of diversity, and if indeed for, for these complex traits or chronic traits that are common, that it is a function of gene environment interaction, we're going to need uh, to, to see a lot of diversity and be inclusive. And probably a lot of people view that last statement as, as one of maybe it's political correctness on one hand, and also it, it makes the study a challenge. I, I would uh, put forward there's actually a lot of advantages by, by bringing in more diversity into the sample set we, we, there's more information there that we can leverage. There may be discoveries you cannot make in, in group one. It is quite possible in group two because the, the obvious one is the variant is, is present in group two. But anyway, I would encourage us to think of this diversity as a positive um, moving forward. So I'll pause there. I tried to get all of these priorities on one slide. And let me, let me first ask, are there any high priority points that you think I'm missing, so we don't keep try to keep the um, discussion on, on, on point. Daniel? Uh, um, perhaps this is captured within the population diversity aspect, but I think uh, there, are, there are some very strong benefits to including isolated and or consanguineous populations, uh, p particularly for the specific goal of capturing homozygous rare loss of function variants, for instance. Yeah, okay. Probably if, I, if we didn't add a Clarifying clause onto it may not, so I think it should be added. That would be great. Yeah. Just to add to that, uh, I think family is, is important, but also I think we spent some time talking about, uh, you know, a very unusual or interesting uh, diseases or modifiers and, and the like that the question is, are many of the cohorts going to have, in essence, filtered them out because of the criteria for joining a cohort maybe not having a number of pre-existing conditions. And so I at least wanted to raise that question because it in going exclusively towards cohorts, then you you do raise that that problem of, of excluding other groups. And so, you know, in thinking about not the pie that we're gonna make, because pie you always have to mix everything up. You you know, you cut up something that's made to look like a pie the pipe that we would want to put this through, you know, the sort of Bernoulli's principle of how much fluid is going to come from which particular viaduct, I think I'd want to put on the table, that there'd be some element from the EMRs of particularly interesting patient populations that may be very, uh, very novel and give us information about modifiers and different ways of looking at, at some things is, a, is some small percentage of that. Okay. That, that's a disadvantage of making the slides before, um, and I, I agree with you. As I, as I mentioned, I'm a big fan of case cohort designs. I, I think if we think hard about this, we have the ability to bring in lower frequency case groups that would be, um, nor, quote, normally present in many of these cohort studies. So I think it's an ideal opportunity. And probably that's the one big way I would modify this slide list, is the ability to bring in I don't want to say rare case groups, but, but case groups that may not be represented at high enough power. Sample size. 
And perhaps the other point is one that Maynard raised earlier about uh, focusing on individuals who are, are healthy despite having a high exposure to risk, either environmental or genetic, and that may need to be something that's captured uh, explicitly. I guess from experience, they're in here. Sure. They would be in here. Sure, but if, the, if there is a way of enriching for those samples, that would be... Eric, could I ask what, could you define what you mean by case cohort? So you have, let's forget the brain, but the other many cohorts. Let's say brain, nobody knows who loves brain, so you have a good sampling framework from your geographic location, you randomly sample by some method. But then in addition, from that same core population, you're identifying case groups. And so you're comparing the case groups Cohort in the sample. The methodology takes into account there may be some cases, that's why it's not case control, there may be some cases in that cohort. These are some unresolved issues that I found that throughout the day you know, we bounced around them. Uh, one is families. You know, we, we, every once in a while, so, you know, families are important, families are important, but I don't think we've done a good job of clearly articulating the role of families. How would we use families in their areas? And, and I think it requires a little more thought. I don't know if we're going to do it right now. But, but right now, if we keep going, you know, the sort of inertia is, my guess is that we poor representation of families in this Unless, Thank you. Unless we give it a little more thought. Um, you know, it's, it is obvious that families have uh, the ability to see another copy of a very rare allele. Um, that's uh, that's an obvious application. My my difficulty or my problem with that is that that sibling, for example, probably has all of the other variants that surround those that one rare allele, and so there, it's difficult to disentangle. So I think number one is we need to do a better job of families. Number two, last night I guess there seemed to be more enthusiasm than today about integrating other omic technologies. And maybe that's in the, lumped in with other phenotypes, but I, my own opinion is we shouldn't lose that. Whether RNA-seq, someone measured RNA-seq data, I think would be very valuable. Um, I, I really would like us to see a, a mention of the ability to bring along other omics. To my surprise, one of the things I've learned the last 24 hours is, um, I guess this would be for staff, or, or the investigators could meet, uh, we need to push continued development in analytic frameworks. Um, we, we really need to push more analytic, um, new analytic development. And I think right now the problem is that many of the people I know who are doing this work, we're so overwhelmed with applications, we have data coming out of our ears, there is, we're not spending a lot of time on new analytic methods and the testing of new analytic methods. So I hope I'm wrong with that statement, but I'm wondering if the time is right as part of the, as preparation for this project is pushing a, a, a group to consider new analytic developments. Those are some unresolved issues I see from this meeting. Hi, Kishel. Hi, Eric. Um, on the family issue, I think it, it's difficult. Well, we saw in GWAS that many of the cohorts did have families within them. However, in the analysis, they were kind of adjusted out. They were clustered out. Um, but so it's hard to think about combining an association and a family study. But at NHLBI, at least, many of our cohorts do have families. And if those cohorts that had families built in could be represented in some way so that we could tap the power of the family study design, perhaps in a second stage, as Evan brought up. Um, that might be something to think about. Another uh, thing I wanted to throw out there is that NHLBI has an RFA out there to do sequencing in families. At this point, we're just starting out. Could be looked at as a pilot study. Um, some of the groups are doing whole genome, some are doing exome, so, but they're in smaller samples. So. Other comments, let's say you have a role of families. Any other comments on the role of families and the importance of including at least some family of the age? There are some. Uh 
non-trivial sequencing studies underway involving families. I think some in type 2 diabetes. One of the type 2 diabetes projects I'm not involved in is doing some work on large pedigrees. Yeah. Uh, is it known, do we know enough to know, I mean that's potentially valuable information on the, informing these kinds of discussions and I wonder what we know about how those studies have gone. I mean, I yeah. The results are just like the results for everything else yeah. so far. Uh, Chris? One other comment on families in terms of um, getting the most bang for your buck is you, you can impute un unsequenced family members and, and actually gain more um, power, if you will, by virtue of, of doing that. We've done that in Framingham, and I'm sure it could be done as long as you have substantial, um, you know, first degree relatives, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, I, I think in the cancer world, there, there, you know, 30 to 40 years of collection within the NCI and a number of extramural groups that are deep into the exome and whole genome sequencing. And it, you know, and some of them have actually looked at, you know, these data you know, with FBAT tests and the like and seen some very interesting things. So I, I think that there is, there certainly is precedent and there's very large numbers of individuals there. But one of the things that's really interesting about the family studies for younger outcomes, if you look in the literature for some of the cardiac outcomes and now autism, testicular cancer, there are others where you see de novo mutations with larger structural events that are taking place that germline. may be, yeah, germline mutations that are particularly interesting for, you know, a range of pediatric conditions. Uh, that, again, family structure would allow you to get, but you have to very specifically hypothesize that you're doing that. I'm not, I'm not sure that that would be a major goal, but again, this question of de novo events, if you have family structure, and knowing sort of what that, perhaps the other side of that is people who have these de novo events and live on and are getting into their 60s and 70s without any problems. You know, one of the real advantages of a family is that it allows you to see a very rare mutation in multiple individuals. The larger the family, the better. And that's something that will be difficult across a population. Some of them will be novel to the family, but they might tell us about a biologic pathway or gene of interest. They have to say there's enthusiasm for thinking about how families could be part of, part of this equation, okay? That the chorus has risen up, okay? We will modify uh, this list accordingly. Just uh, one question regarding the existing cohorts and the family information that's in them. It seems to me that families are most useful when there's a high incidence of a disease in question within the family. Right. Um, so how often is that the case? I think it's going to depend how the family is interacting, how the individuals within the cohorts are ascertained to go out and go large, fairly random cohort that certain case groups were used for probands to then build families. Those two exist. How frequently they are, I don't think I can speak. All right. Thank you. So the next uh, major category you're going to are wisdom updates. <laughs> So it's, it's hard to actually make the jump because what's worked well by putting the family consortia and case controller cohort together for GWAS doesn't apply. That is, it's very attractive when there's a big, rich family um, discovery group that can say, I found something, now walk it into the population setting or vice versa. But for rare variants, it wouldn't work that way, right? It has in melanoma, the Nature paper last fall. You know, they found it in families, the MITF, and then went into the general population, found something with 1%, and you know, and you could see it in the general population, and very nice 
laboratory confirmation of disruption of simulation of of, of that the variant. I mean, it's a it's a nice example whether that's. But that's what we do for things at one percent and above. Doesn't it, by definition, almost not work if they're if they're really <coughs> idiosyncratic, uh, not one offs, but. It, it, I'm not sure it translates. Because the, the same gene, though, might be, that exact variant may not be, but the same gene may be, so that focus you in on an interesting biology. So that, I think, would be the recommendation for your priorities, is not that we try to put families in, but that we make sure that wherever we sequence in a population group, it is coordinated with an intense family study, and that only be done where there is, in fact, uh, uh, yeah, but I don't think you can smush them. 